future plans. What are your thoughts about the future? What would you like to do? What would you like to accomplish? If the world was perfect, everything was rosy and gravy, what is it that you want to do, brother? Well, I enjoy refereeing a lot. There's no doubt about it. I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't enjoy it. It's obviously not for the money. You know what? We get paid how many days we're out of work and how many days we miss from our family. So it's not a money thing. It's because you enjoy doing it. Of course. Um, I'm 50 years old this year. Uh, maybe what I have another six, seven years of refereeing, if, if that. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like boxing where you're just in one area. It's a lot easier to referee boxing. It's, it's, there's no comparison. You know, we're down on our knees looking up, trying to you know see if the person's conscious or unconscious, and it's harder for us to protect the fighter and do our job and make sure he's safe in the ring than it is for boxing. So if after that, I want to go back to training fighters again. I truly enjoy training fighters. I did it for years, and uh, I miss it. So. I have a couple of guys I train now that are amateurs, and once they turn pro, I let them loose to other instructors that I know that are good, and uh, they take them over because I can't really referee and uh, train right, the pro fighters. Yeah, you can't yeah, do yeah. It. So that would be my thing. Once I hit the age where I'm not quick enough, and I feel like I'm you know, slow down, and I can't get to the, to stop the next impact of a blow that's after, coming after a person's already unconscious, mm. then I'm going to say, okay, it's time. Because the last thing I want to do is have a fighter get injured due to my incompetence because I was too slow, I wasn't agile enough to get where I needed to be. So I'll go back to training fighters, I like that, I enjoy it. Absolutely, so would it be, because to me it almost sounds like, and I don't know, maybe I, I don't know if I'm right or if I'm wrong with this, but you like to take the guys, really just the young guys and, and get them started, you know what I mean? Get them what they need and bring them to the, you know what I mean, to the right place. Right. You know what I mean? You're, you're starting these guys off. I, am, am I wrong or? No, it's just like another sport. I coached both of my sons growing up from four years old till they were 19 years old. And when I see other coaches coach that are just there for their children only, not to coach the other kids on the team, it drives me crazy because you, you look at the quality of those kids and they suck. They're, they didn't <laughs> learn as other kids did because they were there for their children only. I was never like that. When I coached my kids, I was harder on my kids than I was on the other team. If one of my children struck out or, or dropped the ball, I look at him like, bro, you know you can catch that. What's the matter with you? Someone else's kid drops the ball and strikes. I'm like, hey, don't worry, little Johnny. Next time you'll do better. You know. So I was harder on my kids, but I trained all the kids the same way. And same thing with martial arts. You know, I've come up through the ranks. Started as a white belt. I got my fifth degree black belt in Kempo. I'm an instructor in Muay Thai, instructor in shoe fighting. Uh, got my blue belt with hands on. The reason why I haven't gone up in ranking that is because I own a school, and that was the deal I made with them. I would have. Get any rank. You know, there's no competition in the same state, same area. Yeah. yeah. And, and how ironic is it now that I train, I teach Muay Thai at his school in Home Down, New Jersey. <laughs> <right>. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I I feel that if you're coaching these these young fighters, and you're making them better, you know, they're just gonna be that much better when they get to the pro level. Bringing these kids up, and you know, like we said, you were saying that yeah, you were bringing them, uh, you know, through the right ranks, getting them started properly. Please, you know. Well, I'm saying, like, you know, you bring a, a, a kid that was a wrestler, let's say, and he comes to MMA, which is a great background. I can take a wrestler and in four or five months have him a, a pretty decent fighter, where like a boxer or a karate kid is going to take a lot longer. The skills you learn with wrestling, the body mechanics and the positioning and how not to be swept, that's very, very hard to teach. That comes with years of practice. The striking is very easy to teach. The anti jiu jitsu, I'll call it, is not hard to teach either. Jiu-Jitsu, all right, that comes with time and training, you know, for sure, you know, to pull it off, set it up, and everything like that. But if you just teach them, keep their arms in tight, you know, keep your hips down low, don't get bad positions, don't get swept, don't get your head up, you know, posture, those are easy things, and that's what we call anti-Jiu-Jitsu. Anti um, so I have some kids that never grappled, they only did uh, wrestling, they never did submission, and they're doing good. I mean, I have one kid right now, he's 11 and 2, when I first got him, he was 0 and 3. So, he's, I'm sorry, he's 11 and 4 now, he was 0 and 3 when I got him. So he's doing good. He's doing real good. You know? There's a couple of kids I'm training that are doing good too, but it's just you can take a wrestler and really progress fast with a wrestler if they're good at it. And you know, you got Jones. He was a great wrestler. Look at him, 23 years old, was champion. I know. You know. And didn't just win it. He, you know, rough. He he won it pretty easy. Yeah, I know. He no. Listen, he's definitely uh, as far as talent wise, and I'll I'll get into that another time because the honest truth to me. There's very few real, real talent, and I don't care whether it's MMA or boxing. When it comes down to it, I have very specific ideas and thoughts on what these fighters should be doing and how they should be doing it. I mean, I'm going to look at it a little bit differently and say, look, these guys are paying for the action, and when you're coming in there as points, it's not the way fights used to be. I mean, these guys, if you threw them into the rings 50 years ago, 60 years ago, before they had final rounds where they said, okay, this is the last round, 
You kidding me? People were fighting until someone was knocked out. Someone was going, you know, getting carried out of that ring. That's what a pugilist fight was, you well, know? That's the UFC started, if you think about it. When the UFC first started, there was no time limit. Um, there was no rounds. You exactly. Fought. And it was hard to sell that because how do you have an event on pay-per-view? People are paying to watch it for two hours and the first fight lasts an hour and 10 minutes or 40 minutes. And there's eight fights on the card. It's hard to sell that. So that's why they came up with the unified rules. It's one of the reasons why. Also the safety of the fighters, of course. But, of course. You know, three minute or five minute rounds, amateur, some of them are two minute rounds. There's, there's different rules. But if everybody follows unified rules, every referee's job is easy because you know what it's like. Every show is the same thing. You know, you can't make it more dangerous by saying, okay, today we'll allow stomp kicks to the head of a grounded opponent, but tomorrow we're not going to, and we're going to allow knees to the head of a grounded opponent. You know, you keep the unified rules the same. Of course, nothing's perfect. You know, people dislike the, the completely down downward elbow. Why can't you do that when you can do all the other elbows? They're just as dangerous as each other. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you're always going to have an area where people don't agree upon things. But for the most part, the guys sat down, they, they decided what they felt was going to make this not so barbaric because people considered it barbaric back in the day. Sure. Uh, like a cock, human cock fight. They felt like it was ridiculous watching two men in a ring until someone passes out and gets knocked out or, you know, gets carried out. So with the rules now, it's a little bit safer. And we do have athletes. There's no doubt about it. These are athletes that are in the ring. They're not barroom brawlers. They're not, you know, a bunch of drug addict punk kids. They're, oh, yeah. they're athletes. There's no doubt. Well, you can agree with that for sure. They are definitely yes. athletes. And when you bring pro fighters, you know, supposedly uh, football players, or any basketball players, anyone who's trained in other sports, and they bring them over for MMA training, you, you and I mm -hmm. both know this, they will very quickly, very quickly. It's not the same. No. The MMA training, I believe, is the hardest and most strenuous training True. out of all fight training that's out there. And I've trained boxing. I've trained MMA, obviously. Mm -hmm. And between the difference between the two for me, I believe that it was MMA was definitely killer. Because we're up on the floor, we're, up, you know, we're doing our ground fighting, our middle, our middle tactics, our far tactics, how are we striking, you know, all of these things, it's, and you have to put it all together like a, a nice kind of a chef making a stew, a beautiful stew. Did you stir the pot right? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, everyone is different. You have different guys, different strokes for different folks. People that are great on their feet and not so great on the floor, or vice versa. Or maybe they have a great, you know, stand-up grappling game, but, you know, like Kotor did, obviously, look at how he took his championships. Took you from the fence, got you tired, worked you to the ground, and beat the crap out of you. And you got to respect the man. The man, listen, he, he's he's not only you know a sweetheart of a guy, but he's a legendary fighter. He is. And look at how it's progressed. You get guys like Couture, Chuck Liddell, Tito Ortiz. These guys were the best of the best. Now, they really can't beat guys that are just coming up. Mm. The sport has progressed so much that the guys before then, now, when was the last time you saw a Gracie win? Do you yeah, know? Right? No. You know, you see guys that do jujitsu and Muay Thai, jujitsu, Muay Thai, and wrestling. You don't see anybody walking with a gi and a belt on and, and, and going to the ring like Hoist did. Hoist wouldn't last with guys that are just coming up now that have had four or five pro fights. These kids today are training everything they have. Their stand up, their takedowns, their defensive takedowns, their their submission holds on the ground, standing up, their striking, boxing, Muay Thai. I mean. It's unbelievable. These kids are really good and they're just getting better and better. And like I said, the champions of just five years ago wouldn't even make it through two rounds with these kids that are runner-ups or second or third string, you know, not third string, but not quite championship level fight yet. They yeah, wouldn't yeah. even beat those guys, you know, and also legends. I mean, they're Hall of Famers.